Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Hey guys, uh, welcome back to Construct Your Life. This is Austin Linney. Uh, I've got a real special guest here today, uh, Aaron Amusa Stegi. Is that did I say it right, sir? I'm sorry, yeah, man. You, that, that 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 is definitely close enough. All right, fair enough. I'll take it from a Texan. Uh, he does the best he can. Man, this guy, um, you know, he's such a special guest. Inspired me. I heard him on Matty A's podcast. Uh, Iron Man. A uh, real estate investor, but most of all, uh, you know, a great dad, and that's what inspires me. So, Aaron, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about um, your story, and and kind of we'll get rolling here. If I'm really on my game, I'm I'm a husband and a father of four, and yeah, you know, so the I, I want to be able to lead with that. I need to remind myself like that's my most important thing, because um, it's because it's not always it's hard to balance life. So I'm a husband, father of four. My kids are. 12, 10, and 9, I've got three girls, and I have a son that's four named Brax, and so that has been the wild uh, change in our lifestyle. So as Austin said, I, I invest in real estate. I buy and sell real estate. I've had a lot of different businesses and different things. I mean, the, the Cliff Notes is, you know, 2005, you know, graduated from Cal Poly and construction management, got to work at the height of the housing boom for some uh, home builders, and I got to run an operation in Southern California of a big home builder. Everything's awesome. Getting paid a lot of money. We're golfing two or three days a week. Housing market crashed, and we we were trying to figure out what to do. The company had to lay off seventy five people. There was like five of us left. We moved from beautiful Santa Barbara up to Sacramento, where the home builder had some bad projects left. In Santa Barbara, we didn't really know what was happening, um, and we started trying to find and do a bunch of different businesses. Instead of golfing a few days a week, we had to go back to doing like hard labor and construction. I had to with those business partners figure out how we could do these bank workouts, uh, so they didn't have to file bankruptcy. And they worked out all these different things. And then somewhere, you know, middle of 2009, we discovered buying foreclosures on the courthouse steps. Uh, it was a new thing. Nobody was doing it. There were two or three people doing it. There weren't classes. So we had to teach ourselves how to do it. Uh, August of 2009, uh, my second daughter, you know, she was staring in the bed in the NICU. I was like, wow, I did this to my family at that time. We had taken big pay cuts. We were working around the clock. My wife was a waitress at the casino, working nights at the casino. I was working during the day. And so when I saw that my baby was born early because my wife was a waitress, I was like, this is my fault. Uh, but that was also my uh, September 2009. That was also my moment. I said, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to try to go all in on this new business. Um, there were a lot of ups and downs with that business. But just to, to really speed it up, like we went from doing a couple houses to getting to do a lot of houses, to getting investors, hedge funds. We flipped like a thousand houses and uh, scaled that. And around 2012, 2013, if you would have thought everything was amazing. We were making like $100,000 a month. My wife was my broker. Um, you know, we were, our businesses were just crushing it. And this company came in and said, hey, we're going to get into this, you know, single family rental industry. We want to buy your company. We want you to come help run it for us. And we were too cocky to even know what that was. Like we had a front row seat of what was going to happen. I'm like, you're not going to put us out of business. I don't want to go get another job. We're making this much a month just on our commissions. And uh, the long story short is uh, they put us out of business. At the same time, my marriage was falling apart because my wife and I were focused too much on ego and competing with each other in business. And hey, we're making so much money. And we were having nannies raise our kids. So we weren't really being parents. We weren't even being spouses. We weren't being loving people. Uh, we weren't trusting God. We had got super cocky and the, and all that came crashing down and we lost it all. So 2012, 2013, lost over a million dollars in cash. I had these you know, giant businesses, company trucks, employees, and all of a sudden down to nothing. And after flipping a thousand houses, I was like, whoa, um, that helped us recenter and do a few things. We got a new focus that family was first. Um, you know, we learned from our mistakes. We, for a long time, we prayed and said, man, if we ever get it, God, if we ever get another chance at this, um, we're going to totally do it different next time. Somewhere in that crash, my wife and I found God again. We, we figured out how to be good spouses and good family members and things like that. And then 2015, we got that new second chance, started coming out to Texas where no one was going to courthouse step auctions at the time. That was my specialty. I was able to start flying out here once a month. And from there, and a lot of that is like, that's the cliff notes. Now we have a few hundred houses as rentals. We buy a bunch of houses every month. Uh, we, we, we get to fix them and flip them and rent them. 
but the our proud thing this time is we are doing it as we homeschool and travel the world. We're not traveling right now. We're all, you know, obviously nobody is. But the just different values. Last time we built a business because we wanted to build a business and we wanted to be cool and we wanted to have lots of employees and we wanted everyone to think that we were really neat people. And instead of donating to the church, we would throw these extravagant pool parties. You know, this time around we're uh, doing stuff the right way, we say. You know, it's family first and focus first and our relationship first. And we've been really lucky to get a second chance at all this, man. It's amazing, guys. And that was a lot of clip notes, guys, because I know a story a little more than some of the listeners maybe. So we're going to dig into a lot of those parts. Um, you know, I think first, you know, the reason I connect with your story so much is, you know, I, I look at people and, you know, I model lives and, and pick up, you pick up things and stuff like that. But what I want to really dig in today is kind of like, you know, do you think that it would have been better to like lose at the beginning? Cause like you came out and you were, you were running hot, like you, man, you're golfing, dude. I just, Santa Barbara's amazing. So, I mean, right. you're, you know, life is good. I mean, you're looking at it and like, you know, we're dealing with an economic shift as we sit here today having this interview. So, you know, I'm kind of trying to add value to the listeners and saying, how do you like, you're not mad that you went great, but like, what did you learn from like riding so high for so long and then it coming down? I think the, uh, it, it's a good point. Cause you're like, Hey, it started out so well. And then you got cocky. The crazy part was I had a lot of other bottoms in my life, right? And the, that I should have learned from, you know, so the, when I was, when I was 20, I spent two years in prison. Like that is, that is like a crazy offshoot too, where people can like, look it up. Like I was a a high school graduate at the top of my class, you know, 4.0 doing so great, started partying too much, started doing crazy stuff, getting into drugs, got myself in a lot of trouble. So like 22, like I was in prison for like prime years of my life. Right. I'm like, I'm 21 sitting here like uh, as a kid. So the, that should have been my bottom that no matter what, I would never take it for granted. Um, and so one of the lessons to learn is everyone's going to have lots of ups and downs, especially right now. A lot of people are having downs and it's a great time to reflect back and sit and look at the stuff that we took for granted, because every time we have an up and down, we're going to learn something. So I didn't learn everything that I was supposed to when I was 22 in prison. Right. Uh, or I wouldn't have screwed it all up in 2012 and 2013 from getting too cocky and putting my family at risk and all that. Mm -hmm. Um, But every time you have that down, like right now is a downtime. So I think about this as what's funny is when I think about the real estate, I think about the opportunity in investing and things like that, that came out of like 2008, 2009, 2010, really horrible time. But there's also a lot of opportunity for the people that want to focus and work hard and, and push. Um, But 2012, 2013, I lost all my money. My wife and I were in shambles. We're like, how are we going to pay our bills? How are we going to do everything? Thinking back to just a couple months prior, I was making $100,000 a month, and now I have $0, and how do I pay my mortgage, right? So, And a lot of people out there listening right now might be going through the same thing. And I'd say right now is an ideal time to do two things. One, reflect back on the last year, two years, three years. There's, There's going to be things in this world that change. And we're all going to be going through kind of those stages of grief right now to go like, what are you grieving the loss of? But, but think about, you know, what did you miss? What, what over the last few years would you do different? So that's one thing people can do now. What did you take for granted? What did you spend on? What are you going to do when this gets better and you get a second chance at success in life? Because it will happen. Everyone will get that second chance. It might be six months from now. It might be a month from now. It might be two years from now. And so I don't know how long your mantra is going to be. The next thing to do is start visualizing. And go five years from now, 10 years from now, what is your story going to say about 2020, right? Your story is going to be like, hey, 2020 was rough. We were on quarantine for four weeks or six weeks or who knows how long, right? We were on quarantine for this long and this part of my business fell apart and this part of my business fell apart or, or my friends had this happen and I had to lay these people off, but then I changed this, this, and this. So start writing your story too to where five years from now, 10 years from now, you're going to look back on this time. And you're going to accept the pain for what it is, but also what did, how did it change you? Right. I hear a lot of people right now saying, Hey, I'm spending more time with my kids. We're going for on walks every night. You know, we're going for bike rides in the morning. And I would encourage people to it's over too. You're still going to do that. Like, look at what's happening in quarantine right now. That, that is that benefit. So yeah, during, so I mean, that, that's kind of a roundabout way to answer your question, but the, yes, that they, for my takeoff of like, Hey, 2009, 
It was a crash. Everybody was failing. We found this like loophole business that was working and all of a sudden we were super, super successful. Um, that happened way too quick. The other thing that I wish I would have had in like 2010, 2011, 2012 that I didn't have was a mastermind of peers. Anybody around me that was successful. I didn't know anyone successful. I didn't have a single person that I could talk to and say, whoa, I made $100,000 last month. I, all I had was friends at my, you know, other parents at my kid's school. Mm -hmm. Right. And so mm -hmm. I didn't know when I was getting out of hand. I didn't know that I should have been investing that money in something else because if I would have spent, if I would have invested in 2010, I would have been set for life. You know, mm -hmm. the, um, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know when stuff started to go down. So I wish I would have had other people to talk to and that I would have been willing to be open and have those conversations because someone could have helped me. I'm in masterminds now and I just think, wow, if I would have known any of those guys back in 2012, like my network, like my, my net worth is doing great right now. It isn't doing great right now, but it would be 10 times higher if I'd had people helping me back then. Thousand percent proximity is power. And it, it, you know, I feel like I'm, you know, we're coming out, we're, we're ready to rock. And then you have a conversation with a couple guys like you and it, it really makes you download for a week and, and make sure that you've got your stuff in order. Cause they're, they're the truth serum. Like they don't, there's no, there's no BS getting by, you know? And, and so, you know, it's funny. I, I I look at the same way you look at it with this quarantine. I, I see families out walking with their kids the first time I've seen in like years. So like life's a choice. Like, you know, I'm teaching myself Spanish. I've read like 18 books, like, you know, I'm starting new businesses. So, you know, it's like, it's a choice, man. You can, you can choose to look at the news all day or you can choose to, to get on busy living. And, and, and it's funny, something I've been kind of beating the drum with, you know, and this is the truth. Like everybody thinks the biggest vices in the world are gambling drugs and sex. You know what the yeah. biggest vice for people not reflecting on themselves? It's work. Yeah. Right? And everybody has to look in the mirror right now and it's really affecting a lot of people. But if you're surrounded by the right people, you know, as yourself and, and so on and so on, you can, you can really come out of this, you know, winning. And, you know, I would really love if you could share, <laughs> I mean, I just want to dig into the mind a little bit of when you're making a hundred thousand dollars a month. I did not know that. So that's wild. What the feeling that changes, but then you're, you're making all that money. The money sit in the bank account. You're buying three. I heard your story. You're buying $3,000 sunglasses, all that stuff. And then to go and have to repair a marriage and become an Uber driver, you know, what are you telling yourself every day to get in that car and, and make those couple dollars right opposed to a hundred thousand dollars what are you what are you telling yourself what mindset are you setting the direction on you for your day yeah so when somebody when you lose something you have these stages that go through like one of them is like like bargaining where you want to go like well no this this is going to get better or, or maybe it's not or maybe it's going to be okay and then you get these different stages where you're at like loss and, and finally you come to acceptance getting to acceptance was the first part and then just getting into the idea of faith of faith of every day of going, Hey, this is what I need to do today. And it was praying and hoping and saying, when I get myself out of this, I'm going to do it different. And the, and I think that's part of when I had finally had really learned and accepted. And, and I think when it was, when it was really true that the next time I got a chance, you have to have a certain amount of pain before you actually do change. Mm -hmm. Like if, if everybody gets out of this and everybody gets the same job back and the same everything, then this pain will be quickly forgotten. Uh, the six weeks that we were home. I think that it's going to take longer than that. Um, but it's once I'd actually learned the lesson, I felt like that was when God opened back the doors back up and said, okay, here's your second chance. Then. It's almost like, it's almost like you had to go down that road and, and feel that pain. And, and, and that's deep pain. You have kids, you have a wife that you're watching in front of you to, to be able to have the impact that you're having currently. Right. And, 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 and you're not the first person I've met that has built these big businesses and, and, and woke up one day and go, you know what, this is ridiculous. And you're, you're trying to keep this, it's, it's a hard to explain, but you're trying to keep this like ball rolling because you're employing all these people and you want everything. But what I feel like now is like through those trials and tribulations, you know, through jail, through losing and everything, I feel like your life is a lot more set from intentions, right? And then goals. Like that's what I admire about um, you know, how, you know, Maddie and, and all you guys, how you have these huge businesses, but you're still a father first. Right. And I'm sure that's a delicate balance when, 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 you know, like real estate is hot and cold, right? So when it's hot, you want to, you want to, you want to throw the throttle down, but you've made an intention that you're going to be, you know, a loving husband and a father. So 
you know, talk about how you, how you set those parameters and those, I guess boundaries would be the really the, is that having a great team? I heard an interview. Did you say that you sometimes don't answer your emails and like you make your team like figure it out? Yeah. So the, that's part of that kind of four hour work week mentality thing too. It's, it's, it's realizing there's no emer- like there's no true emergencies out there. I mean, I've literally had houses burned down that I own and it didn't matter when I got that phone call. And people are in that mindset of like I can't turn off my phone, I can't turn off my email cuz people need me right now. But I try to encourage you like, "Hey, everyone's been on a plane with no internet and you were on that plane for 5 hours and nothing and 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 you got through it." So like 6 8 hours a day. That's why I like to do my emails before like 9 a.m. and then just turn it off. Because then if you sit there watching your email, waiting for one to come in, your day is just going to, you're not going to get anything done. You know, especially if you start at like seven in in the morning, six, seven in the morning when everybody else is asleep, you're going to reply to all your stuff and then just turn it back off and then to learn how to handle it. Or worst case, you put on your autoresponder, hey, I'll be back tomorrow at 7 a.m. if you need me. It's kind of like it's always a vacation email. And that helps you focus on multiple businesses. Like that's how somebody could actually have a lot of different businesses. And then also appreciate and get to live the life that they are trying to live with their family. You know, um, part of the stuff that happened, right, was we thought back, whoa, you've heard the story, right? I I had a bunch of like sunglasses that I paid $3,000 for, like totally stupid, right? Like these stupid, stupid things that when we had so much money and no guidance and no mentors, we just didn't, we weren't doing the right stuff, right? And so then you look back on, and during that time of when you hit down, like a lot of people are down right now. I went, man, I wish I would have not done that. I spent all this money on things. And then at the end of the day, I didn't have that. Why didn't we go? Like my wife had always been begging me to travel. And I had this crazy fear of flying. So I'm like, no, I'm not going to go anywhere. We're not going to do anything. And one of those lessons that we learned that kind of changed with that is like, wow, our family is so much more important than what it was. We wasted on all these like superficial things trying to like create friendships. If we get another chance, it's going to be experiences over things. And if my wife stays married to me through this, Mm -hmm. I'm going to give her all that stuff that she wanted. And so it was like now a couple of years after that, right? We got our passports in January. And by the end of that year, we had gone to like 13 different countries. And part of that was um, my dad had also died like right around that same time. And he died with money in the bank and all these things he was going to do that he didn't get to. So that helped reshape our idea too. So we came out and said, hey, if we ever get another chance, We're going to do this, this, and this right. And then we're going to not take life for granted. And so we spent the last several years like traveling two to three weeks a month with our kids, homeschooling them. We pulled them out of school so we could do all this, have all these different experiences to really make the most out of life. And one of the things that we would tell ourselves is like, life is short. Like I may die tomorrow. You know, there may be all these different things. So let's do it now while we can because money comes and goes, but experiences, those memories stay forever. That was the one thing that we knew in those bottoms, the things that like, the trips that we did do and go on were the only things that we didn't regret. That was the only stuff when we hit our bottom and we were broke again. We weren't like, man, we were thinking back to like these 4th of July's where we had my, my dad and my mom come down and all these big events. We're like, man, we didn't regret that stuff. We didn't regret the family experiences. We regretted the sunglasses. And so now we came out of that. And, and we, so we started traveling more and more, uh, going all over the place. And I tell you what, that last week, my wife looked at me and said, I, this was really the whole point of it. Our hope with, with it is my wife said, God, I sure am glad that the last few years we did all that stuff because now anytime we want to go to like, we, we've been to Haiti several times. Well, now we can't go to Haiti because Haiti is in a bunch of political unrest right now and they won't let Americans in. That was before coronavirus. And so it's like, do the things now. So when these doors open up and people are allowed to get out again, and do stuff. I would say, do all the things that are on your list. Like don't have a bucket list and say someday we do one thing every month. That's on our someday list. Uh, and because life is short and you never know. And that really came from the lesson of losing my dad and being broke at the same time. And the, and so, yeah. So as we came out of it, we've just done so much the last few years. And now we're looking back and going, we're so glad we said yes to this, 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 and this, because that might be gone forever. That might be one of those things. We, we, there, some of that stuff is the stuff that we're mourning now. Um, but yeah, but it is, but it's very intentional. My wife and I sit, you know, once a month, once every couple months, look at our calendar, look at our schedule. What do people want? You know, my daughter really liked Broadway. So we were scheduling that, you know, who, who in the family wants what let's do these trips. Let's do these things. But it's been our mantra of that experiences over things. And then through that too, we've done things like, uh, you know, you, you talked about learning Spanish and stuff while you're off, you know, we, we did an Ironman, 
Uh, my wife ended up doing one with, with me a year later after seeing that experience. And those were just some things that I would have never done before. I went from being afraid of flying to be an executive platinum status on American Airlines. I fly over 100,000 miles a year. I go to lots of countries every year, um, you know, get to, been all over the place in Africa and Dubai and, and Japan and all these fun places. And we take our, our, our family there too. So um, you know, being really in, intentional of the things that I was never going to do, we do them now. And even the things like the Ironman, I was, I was not a healthy guy. I was never going to do that. Part of that, again, is the, the group, the mastermind groups that help hold me accountable and encourage me to do stuff too. Yeah, hey guys, this interview is officially mine now. I don't care if y'all are listening or not. I'm just kidding. But no, everything you said made my heart sing. And that's what I've been preaching for a long time. You know, I spent my whole life sacrificing. And, you know, in the last two days, I've crossed off things on my bucket list that have been there for 37 years. And it's yeah. like the heart just sings. And it's like, and that's what I've been preaching to everybody. It's experiences over things. I do not care about cars. I, don't get me wrong. I like to drive a nice one every now and then, but I'll just rent it. I don't need to buy it. And so, um, you know, I guys, I really hope what you're listening to, I mean, this man has multiple businesses, um, you know, for four kids, homeschooling, all the above, and he's still going out and traveling more than probably anybody I know. And I can only imagine um, as a dad, I'm getting like even emotional saying it, the, the impact it has on your soul, seeing your kids maybe touch a beach and wherever for the first time. And they're, they're seeing, you know, um, that special experience that, that a lot of people, you know, never in their life get to experience. I would imagine that's the true fulfillment that you're seeking, right? That's, that is absolutely the biggest part of the fulfillment. And, and especially because, because money comes and goes, it's that whole idea that you need to provide the experiences now, like don't get caught up in like, we need to work to live, but then we say, instead of having a bucket list, everyone has a bucket list. We say, put it on your calendar. Like, don't have a list of things I'm going to do someday. Like, as something comes up, even if you're like, oh, I'm going to go this place someday. Like, just go to your calendar, even if it's two years from now in November and go, this is what I'm going to fly to here. And then two years from now in June, I'm going to buy my tickets for that flight. And then two years from now or whatever, right? Like, don't have a bucket list. Like, have a calendar, like a mm -hmm. to -do list that's on your calendar that you're doing. And then, yeah, it's all like getting to see our kids light up in different ways. And all of us as a family, because right now we have all of those memories. So let's say my business has crashed again. Let's say I get my house foreclosed. Let's say I lose all the stuff. We get to go like, whoa, those few years though, that we really did it all. Because what we learned in, two, in like the 2009 to 2012 run is businesses were really successful, but we didn't go spend it right. And when we lost it, we lost it all anyway. So then it was like doing it now. So now they have all those memories, getting to see them do this stuff, getting to see my kids interact with other kids in Haiti, right? The, the kids that don't have shoes and, and live in houses made of cardboard and our kids are just playing with them, hanging out in their houses and, and helping them fill up their water buckets and stuff like that. You get to see like these true human connections and then that, that experience like, um, yeah, it's, we're never going to regret it right? The experiences are things that you're never going to regret. And I bet everyone right now listening can think back to an experience that they've had in the last couple of years that they like stretched themselves a little, they spent a little bit of money on and they're saying, I'm never going to regret that. Like they don't regret that right now. I bet the stuff that people are regretting right now is taking for granted their favorite restaurant or the last time they were there, they, they were somewhere they didn't actually appreciate it or that last time they did this trip. You know, so the, anyway, it's, we're going to regret that not appreciating the stuff. We're not going to regret the experiences that we created. Thousand percent. And one of the main stories that I love the most, and I want to stick with her for a minute, because I think your wife's really the backbone of this operation. She for is. sure. Um, you know, she made it, I thought it was a big choice for her. You told the story about how she could have easily gone back um, as your agent and, and made some money. But, you know, she said like, no, this is this is my job now and, and you need to go do you. And, you know, I'm sure that sets free a husband to really go out and, and hunt and gather really like knowing that she has such a hold on the family and, you know, talk about the homeschooling, talk about the choice to, to get there, which I think is a something that, you know, a lot of people are doing actually right now. So yeah. I'd be interested to see if some kids don't go back, you know? Yeah. I, yeah. I think some kids, so, um, my wife and I, we have a, we have a book called the five hour school week. And if you start to get interested about inspiration as a, from a parent of homeschooling and education, go find her on Instagram because there is so much daily content that she puts out. Um, back when I had just started to kind of get my business back together, I found this opportunity 
out in Texas. Now here's, here's a part and part of that, part of that story too. So I, I, we found an opportunity out in Texas, but it was like an accident, but it was an example of being willing to do whatever. So I'd already shown I was willing to do whatever to try to, to make it back home. And then I had an apartment complex that I'd bought before, you know, I heard of this auction in Texas. I actually you know flew out there on a whim to go see the auction and uh, I got cold feet. I didn't buy the, the apartment, but then what, what that had held me do was I noticed that no one was at auction. So the next month, got to Texas with, you know, we had hardly any money. I had a line of credit that I could use to go buy a house, drove a hundred houses from a hotel, from the cheapest hotel I could find, comped a bunch of houses, did title on a bunch of houses, showed up to auction, bought the three houses, went after I bought them, went to Home Depot, bought a drill, drilled out the locks, changed the locks, like put the lock box on, started calling people. And I started my flips again and then flew home. Right. So the, and that was this example of just being willing to like put it all on the line to go try and work, you know, a hundred hours just to see if I can make it work. So around that time, so that was how we got to restart in Texas. And now I was like, whoa, now we have some income again. Around that same time is when we had pulled our, our daughter out of school, both, well, all of our kids out of school, but our oldest was in, I think she was in like second or third grade at the time. And we had really started to have our minds shifting. Our minds were shifting because we had all these experiences. We started traveling. When we would travel, we'd have them be these educational experiences. And we had this kind of accidental education experience happen. So we had, in one of those times of experiences over things that we were just now starting to do, um, but our kids were still going to school. We went to Yosemite for a week. Maybe it was two weeks. We went to Yosemite and we got there. And our plan was my daughter was going to do her homework every night. And I was going to work when we were there. And, um, we got there and we had no internet, no internet, no cell service here in Yosemite. So for like a day or half a day, you're like, you feel naked. Right. So then, and my daughter had forgot to bring her homework. So the, so there's like a day of like, Oh no. And then we finally went, all right, well we're here. So nothing we can do about it. Let's just live. And so every day we went on amazing hikes with the kids and went on these ranger talks where they learned all about like glaciation and, and everything inside, you know, so every day they were like learning and having fun and we're ha- going on these hikes and bike rides and having this amazing family experience that we'll never forget. We got home on that Sunday and I could see the stress in my second grader start to be like, Oh wait, I'm not ready for school. And she was already stressed. She was like reading at a fifth grade level at that. And there was so much pressure. There's a lot of pressure in school right now. And a lot of parents are seeing that there's a lot of pressure in school right now to be better, better, better. I want my kid to read two grades ahead. I can't take my foot off the gas. They need to be a 4.0 plus if they're going to get into college someday. And they're six, you know, like people are, are pushing so hard. Uh, we got home on that Sunday and the, and, and my daughter was like, like so stressed. I'm like, well, here's your homework. Let's just sit down and try to do it. Well, mom cooks dinner. Let's just focus. And that's that four hour work week type focus, right? Where you get rid of all distractions and you help and you knock it out. So over the next couple hours, she did all of her homework from that whole week. Right. And she couldn't believe it. She was like, we're done in that. I taught her long division. Right. And it was like, that was a fun thing of of hers. And I had, I had been a teacher in some other past lives of different things I had done. So it was, uh, so it worked out really well. And she got to school, uh, the next day. And when I went to pick her up in the line, it was so fun because she gets to the car and she goes, dad, guess what? I'm the only one that learned that knows long division. They didn't even get to it last week while we were gone. And so that was our first example of, we had this, this week long, it's like a week or two in Yosemite where we got to just live life with each other as a family and come back. She did all of her homework in two hours. And so it was like a whole week, week, week worth of school in two hours. And she learned more than her classmates did mm-hmm. um, as far as the actual like educational material stuff. And that became the basis of us starting to question school. Why are they in school so much? Why are they doing so much homework? Why are they, why is a second grader reading at a fifth grade level? Um, over the next six months, we started to do every month. We would take them out for a week. We would just leave the homework at home. We'd leave the, we, we'd leave my business at home. And then we'd come back and on Sunday, we'd do the homework and she'd go back to school. And we started to do this. Um, and then come about six months later, we finally decided to pull the trigger the rest of the way and said, Hey, look, we can't even, we don't even want to drop them off at school because we know that they're not going to get the same experience as us. School is perfect for a lot of people. For us, it just wasn't anymore. For us, we had more things we want to do in life. We had these experiences we wanted to do and we wanted them to learn this real life education. So there's a lot of things that we disagree with, with education, but that was, uh, we finally got to the point where we started pulling them out of school, doing all these different things. And, um, and we're really intentional three weeks a month going, going to parties. But back to the question that you asked about, you said like, what about your wife? So at that point, she had really taken the role as taking care of the family. 
part of the reason I was able to succeed in Texas though, that first time is she'd gotten to the point where she's like, Hey, our family is back together. We love each other again. We're okay. We're stable. Like you've got to go do this. She's like, I'll take care of the family. You've got to go handle this. At that time, we had an old investment in San, in San Diego that was owned by investors. We had one in Florida, these big messes that were still from, from, you know, the crap, you know, our, our little crash in 2013. And I was afraid of flying. Right. But it's like, okay. So then I finally went flew to San Diego myself because I didn't have the money to pay anybody else to do it. And I just took a sleeping pill and I'd go do it. Then I went and do it in Florida. But, and then after that, I was, that's how I was able to go to Texas. She was taking care of the family saying, I got this. Now you go fix the businesses. You go rebuild this stuff. We need to do that. It was really easy at the beginning when it was just one or two houses. That was a really good natural fit. And then six months in, in Texas or so, I'm starting to do three or four flips a month. I'm paying commissions for it. So I'm paying $10,000 a house and I'm doing three or four and I'm like, whoa, so I'm paying somebody 30 or 40,000 a month for my listing agent commission. I told my wife like, Hey, you need to go sign up to be a broker now. Like you got to go do these again. And she was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like we just got our life back. We said, if we ever got a second chance, like what would we do different? Like the, um, I'm not going to go to work for you again. I'm not going to be a broker again. Like it's going to mess up our family. It's going to, it's going to mess up everything that we fixed. And I was like, we can't afford it. We can't afford not to, I can't afford for you to not make that 30 or 40,000 a month. And she's like, no, we'll be fine. Like my wife is the most amazing person ever because the, those are like some of the examples of the decisions that she made that absolutely rescued our family and put us to the path we're on now. That was hard to do. Right. Because mind you, when she's a, so she could have been making a bunch as a broker, you get a lot of confidence with that. Back in California, people would make offers and they'd say like, Kalina, I'm so glad I finally get to buy one of your houses from you. Cause she was big. She had all this stuff. She had these big teams. And, and so everyone would call her and be like, you're so amazing. You're like the biggest broker ever. And then instead, when you're a mom at home, the kids are like, make me a sandwich. Right. They're not saying thank you. They're just being like, you know, kids being a mom is like a thankless job. And so she was smart enough to say, no, we have our new roles now. I am going to take care of the kids. I'm going to take care of the family. You go run your business. I'm going to support you in that. And, and at first I thought we couldn't afford to, but what ended up happening was the business grew rapidly and way more rapidly to make up for that lost uh, commission that we had lost from her doing that because the, cause she was right. You know, she had that. And even today there are times when it is, when what she does is thankless, it's not as much fun. You know, the, it is, there's times when I know that she's like, gosh, if I was a broker right now, people would be talking to me a lot different than my kids are talking to me. It's not an easy job, but man, it is a, a huge, huge thing that she does for our family. Like I'll say all the time, like the, we are a two income household. It's just like, she owns my businesses and runs my businesses as much as I do. Her part of that though, is the household. Her part of that, like the, we are equal partners in our businesses. I'm doing my skill set. She's doing hers. If she wasn't doing hers, I wouldn't be able to succeed at mine. The, Amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's so great to have that 50, 50 partnership and, and the support is next level. But something I th- think was interesting I, that affects a lot of people is a lot of people move their life on external, you know, voices from, from society or school or neighborhood. You know, you live in a, Affluent. I know where your house is in California. You live in an affluent neighborhood. I would imagine there was a little pushback from friends, family, people in the community when you when you just yanked your kids out of school. Like, oh yeah, there was there was pushback. There was there was pushback from a lot of a lot of different you know places with that. You know the if you read our book, we talk about we had like friends wanting to do interventions on us. Oh. You know, we had we had a cousin call me. You know probably like six months later and be like, well, at first what you were doing, we thought was pretty crazy, but now we're actually seeing it. Now we're impressed. I want you to know we're supporting it now. And there was, there's all this different stuff because there's a couple different things. Like you're also like kicking the norm. So if you're saying like, Hey, I'm pulling my kids out of school because I think that they will be better off with us going to do these experiences instead with us teaching them what we think is important that they don't actually teach kids in school, like the value of money and healthy risk taking. There's a, there's a list of things that kids don't learn in school that they need in life. The biggest problems that people are having to face right now, they're going to get through it with skills they didn't learn in school, right? As you come out of coronavirus, whatever your success is going to be based on something you didn't learn in school. So we want to fast track our kids to learning that stuff and less important about the stuff that they learn in school. But whenever you, you're doing something like that, people question it. Everyone's very self-centered. So then they think, 
You're doing it for, because of them. They think that you're saying the way they do it is wrong. I'm not saying the way anybody else does it is wrong. For us, this is the way that we choose to do it. I think the people that's, that have their kids go to the same school, we love the school they were going to. It just wasn't the best, best fit for us anymore. Um, but yeah, a lot of people, you know, there's a saying out there that's like, don't, um, don't give credit to people in the cheap seats, right? So if somebody is in the cheap seats of your life, now if somebody's showing up every day and they're a part of it, and they're a part of your life and they love you and they're supporting you through your ups and downs. And they say, Hey, Aaron, I think you should really think about what you're doing here. I, I need to, I need to consider it. I need to make that important. But if somebody is in my life and they're, they're a social media follower and Instagram follower, and they're there for part of it and, and the, the cheap seats, people that aren't actually showing up unless they're showing up to tell you what you're doing wrong. Like those are the people that you shouldn't care what they say. Now that's hard because as a society, we want it. We want to do stuff based on their own. But don't listen to people in the cheap seats. The people that aren't a big part of your life, influencing your life, they don't have a right to say anything. And it's a lot of times that is family. That is, you know, various levels of family because a lot of families are, you know, some are very supportive and very interactive, and others they don't chat all the time. And so there you'd be get questions from that. Friend, you know, other parents at the kids' school. There are a few of those parents that I am really close friends with, and I care about their opinions. There are a lot of others that the you know, that you have to rate like, Hey, were they calling me all the time? Were they my friends outside of class? If not, if this is the only time they've ever called me, then I need to take that with a grain of salt. So whenever you're looking at the influences of society and what society thinks, you have to decide, you know, who is this person in my life? Is their opinion valid in my life? Some people will have a valid reason and a right to have an opinion of your life and other people won't. It's the truth. I mean, my, one of my favorite things about Iron Man stuff is the you versus you. Yeah, I mean, and, and it wasn't until I started stop seeking validation that I, I feel I finally felt free. Right. And so, you know, you and your wife don't need validation from anybody because this is a life that you've chosen and, and that's powerful. And it's it, I, it almost sets you free even more. Right. Because you're you know, in, in every book I read, it's, you know, like society is a herd mentality. And when you break from the norms, people aren't comfortable with you there because they're used to you here. And when they're used to you here, that makes their life comfortable. But the moment that you try to do better or succeed or, you know, I was an alcoholic, right? So, you know, the moment I stopped drinking, everybody's used to drunk Austin, right? And I've been- Absolutely. Yeah. And so like, I'm dealing with that, right? You know, and so you're, you're, not only am I trying to get sober and better my life (laughs) and and totally turn around my life, people are like, what the fuck, dude? You don't want to go drink? And I'm like- and they want to bring you back down. Like 100%. I was that party or two. Like when I went to prison, it was because I was that kid that partied and did too many drugs and everything. And, and everybody loved being able to say like, hey, I'm bad, but I'm not as bad as Aaron. <laughs> like Aaron is the bad one. As soon as I got clean, then they were all like, what the hell? Right? Because then, then, yes, they want to bring you back down. People, like, people naturally, and they don't even know it, right? Mm-hmm. But when you start to make that change, it makes them question themselves. You may have been the guy that they were like, hey, yeah. like he made us feel better. So yeah, you're, it is a double, you know, especially people that get into recovery. It is like a double battle because you have to battle with yourself plus plenty of those people that you thought would be happy for you. They, uh, they aren't. True story, bro. I, yeah. had a, I had a meth problem too. I slept in a closet for six months and all that shit and nobody helped me. I had to work construction for six months and Texas heat. But you know, I lost 40 pounds. I got sober, you know, all these things. And you go home to family and you're like, man. Look, look at me. I'm fucking yeah. kicking ass. You know who many you know how many people cared? Fucking nobody. Yeah, nobody. They, they got their own problems. So Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's the truth. When you can live in yourself and, and you can stare at yourself in the mirror, um, you know, it really is about falling in love with yourself. I mean, that's really what it's about. Yeah. Well, that's also like one of the bit in, in Dave Hollis's new book. I got to interview him on one of my podcasts a week ago. But that's like one of he, he has a list of lies that we tell ourselves. And one of the lies is that everyone is always thinking about us. <laughs> that everybody out there cares so much about what's going on in our life. And that prevents, that is a big lie that prevents so many of us from doing things, right? It prevents us from going and trying because we're worried, what is someone else going to think if I fail or, or, you know, you want to pull your kids out of school, but you don't because you're worried what your sister's going to say or whatever, right? Like there's, yes, the big lie is that everybody's thinking about us when really everybody's just caring about themselves. I'm not going to lie. Jake Harris stole it from me, but I don't care. I stole it from Lamar Jackson. But and I think he stole it from, I don't know, somebody else. But my favorite quote that I live by is, nobody cares, work harder. And it, it, it truly is, you know, you can say what you want about it, but it's the best. So I want to respect your time. Why don't you tell them real quick, all those, how they find you. I'm a podcast host on Real Estate Rockstars uh, websites, Hyben Digital, 
realestaterockstars.com, but just real estate rock stars. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. If anybody wants any advice with stuff, I tell people, find me on Instagram and Facebook, message me, email me, whatever. I'm happy to help people look at deals and find things. People take me up on it all the time. So the, I say this on podcast still every time after the bigger pockets, I had thousands of people reach out, right? That was a, it was a hugely downloaded podcast. I had thousands of people reach out and I've read and I talked to all of them. So mm-hmm. the, yeah, if somebody wants some advice, reach out. And he, and he does guys. Cause I pester him about Iron Man advice. So yeah. one day I'll get to ride with him soon. We will go. Yes, we will go train Wait, soon. I was bummed a few I, weeks ago. I missed no, that. No, 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 no. Look, after yesterday, I got some work to do. <laughs> yeah. I gotta get, I gotta get a new bike. I gotta get these legs. She, uh, we went with a bunch of people. She said, uh, she said, if your legs aren't on fire after each ride, you're not doing it hard enough. I was like, yeah. Oh wow. Okay. If you're not dying. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, so I got one of, one of my, one of my bikes is over here. Yeah. The, oh man. The, that's, that, that's my crazy. Dude, crazy y'all, bike. y'all's setup in, um, in Sacramento, your little training bunker, you and your yeah. wife's, that was, that was something special. That was oh, yeah. getting it done. Our training bunker. Oh, that, and that's one of the keys of trying to get everything. And I think people are learning that right now too. Like we used to take an hour driving to the gym and back. Now you're like, no, if you get it set up at home, you save an hour of your day. And it's the number one out. thing I realized that, that I'm going to do. I make sure that I have all my stuff so you can, because, you know, I heard from uh, Daniel uh, Hilmi, uh, your, your guy. Yeah. in Hillman, sorry. And uh, he said that the biggest thing about Iron Man, especially if you have kids, is you know it, it's so many hours you know of training um, that you know it's you have to be careful right because it's just like it's so time consuming especially a you know 60 80 mile ride on a saturday you know i mean it's forever that that was the first thing they told me when they were training they said look the best goal of iron man is stay married <laughs> right and so the that means like you have to like yeah get up at 4:30 and ride on your indoor bike trainer and, and ride until 6.30. Because if you're working out while everyone else is sleeping, nobody's going to be mad at you. Sure. But if you work out when they're awake, they will be. And it's a sacrifice and taking away. And then, then once or twice a week, going out and riding with other people and, and all that. But yeah, so you think, uh, so I don't have a trainer. So you think the indoor trainer is the key to getting everything done? Yeah. I think, I think it's the indoor trainer, the indoor treadmill. It's the, it is the key to getting everything done because the, you know, I, I think I told you before offline, um, I like watch TV. It's the only time I watch TV is when I'm on a trainer mm-hmm. and then you can get up early and do it. And so when you do a two hour ride from 4 30 AM to 6 30 AM, like that sounds crazy the first week you do it, but your body feels awesome the rest of the day. The sounds other like, thing about yeah. the trainer is like, you'll have a, you'll have like a coach tell you, Hey, you need to ride this much at this level, this much at this level, this much at this level. The thing with those trainers is there's some different apps I can send you. So like Zwift, you can set up a program where it automatically adjusts based on to make you have the most growth. So it'll be like mm-hmm. seven minutes at this level, eight minutes at this level, two minutes of rest. So when you're out riding, you don't, you don't really control it. You just do whatever feels good. or you up and down on the loops? Yeah. On a trainer, you make a lot more progress. That's a, we just, the last five minutes was a selfish part of the interview. I don't even care. He's a man of many talents, boys and girls, and he will respond. I promise you, Aaron, thank you so much, man. Guys, if y'all, what a great interview. Uh, please share, review us, send it out to your friends. Aaron, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. So I'm so glad to chat. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on one-on-one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.